Okay. Um, thank you, Rohan, for the introduction. Thank you, everyone, for organizing uh, the session. It's lovely to be here. I'm assuming everyone can hear my voice, uh, can see my screen, and can see my video. If, if there are any issues, please do let me know. Okay. So I'll be talking about derivative security. This is a, an area of uh, some interest for me. It's, uh, it spans two domains. I, I like to pick topics that um, are at the conferences of different technologies, for example, data security and uh, machine learning. I thought this was an interesting area to study a little bit more and go beyond the obvious, beyond the, you know, how do we do intrusion detection in networks? So that's a fairly common application of machine learning in data security. I wanted to go beyond something that was obvious and, and pick our topic and just learn a little bit. I, I learned by trying different things out. So this was a topic of interest. I, I worked on it sometime last year and did a little bit of a prototype just for our learning purposes. So what is this about? Their uh, enterprises are sitting on large volumes of data. These are generally unstructured data. Structured data is for sure there, but a lot of the volume that enterprises have uh, is unstructured in nature. So this could be uh, images, this could be logs, emails, semi-structured data, videos, and the problem with managing this is uh, huge. So they, I, I came across uh, this idea that maybe we could use some kind of machine learning techniques to see how this data is being used, where it's being copied and what kind of um, compliance issue results from the misuse or the mis uh, storage of these data. So this is a topic that uh, I worked on. A little bit about myself. So I've been now uh, some industry experience. I generally focus on the design and development of enterprise systems, data engineering platforms, distributed systems, which incorporate some machine learning techniques and cognitive applications. I have uh, obtained my PhD from recently, last year, from the Faculty of Inf Information in University of Toronto. Kelly was my uh, on, was on my committee as well. Thanks, Kelly. Okay. So the background of this topic is such that there are very stringent data governance requirements which are imposed on organizations. These, organiza these uh, regulations may be coming from the industry regulators or generally these are practices that are followed in the industry and enterprises, any, industry, any enterprise in that industry needs to follow that. Some of the regulations that come to mind are, uh, I have listed them over here. So for example, if someone is working in the healthcare industry, there's a regulation called, called HIPAA that needs to be followed. HIPAA uh, is very stringent on patient data privacy and security provisions. So we have to be very careful around that. If you're looking at the financial services industry, specifically the payment services industry within financial services, then there's something called PCI DSS that organizations need to adhere to. These are a set of compliance requirements to safeguard customer transaction data or credit card transaction data. So that needs to be very carefully managed. There are other uh, regulations in the financial services industry as well. The GLBA is one and a, a provision in GLBA is around how customer data is going to be protected by financial institutions. Sarbanes-Oxley Act, this, this came about, I think, um, about 15 years back or so after we had those scandals. And that was, so Sarbanes-Oxley uh, Act is, is fairly comprehensive, but there are key areas around data security, which uh, dictate how electronic records could be managed and stored and encrypted. PSD2 uh, is a European Union directive, again, focusing on the transfer of data in end-to-end -end payments. So there are a number of these, I won't go through all of them, but there are a number of regulations that co govern enterprise data. I'll focus a little bit on GDPR. GDPR is a set of rules designed to give European Union citizens more control over their personal data. So while it's a EU regulation, it applies to any organization, any enterprise that is operating in the European Union. Even they may or may not have a headquarters, but as long as they operate in there, they're, they're, this is covering that operation. The aim is to simplify the regulatory environment that exists throughout the European Union so that the citizens and businesses can benefit from a simplified uh, regulatory environment that is 
designed for the digital economy. The specific facet of GDPR that uh, interests me is the right to be forgotten. So individuals have the right to be forgotten, which means that if their data has been collected legally by an organization, they, the citizen can, the European Union citizen can ask or can elect to um, have their results, have their personal data, not to be included in the services which are being provided by the organization. So for example, if, if someone types my name in Google and let's suppose I was a European Union citizen, then I could request Google not to return certain results of mine in their search that uh, anyone can do. This is usually to uh, protect individuals. Let's say if someone committed a crime 20 years back and that's just uh, affecting their uh, employment prospects. So by having these um, right to forgotten clauses invoke that individual can make sure that stuff that happened 20 years ago that has no real bearing in their uh, current life could be removed. Now, this does not mean that the data needs to be deleted from the server. It just means that the data should not be shared with the outside world based on the right to forgotten clause. But here's a problem. The problem is that this data, data that these large organizations collect, it's not stored in one single data repository. In fact, this data is often spread throughout the organization. So for example, if I have, let me just get a pointer. So if I have some source data that was collected, this is where it was in a database. Now this data could be uh, copied out to another server, replicated to another server. So now we have a copy of that data that is created. It could be emailed by someone, so fetched from the database and then emailed as a report to some other individual. It could be possibly, you know, uh, taken, extracted by the data scientist to do some kind of machine learning training. And uh, now it exists on a laptop or a PC somewhere. So you could imagine that the source data that has been collected legitimately by an organization has now been scattered and fragmented and spread throughout the organization. At any point, this data could be brought into a production system accidentally or intentionally and the production system would start processing this data and possibly showing the results as well. This is a problem for organizations that hope to adhere to a lot of these uh, requirements. These security requirements is governance requirements that are imp imposed on them. And um, one way organizations can tackle this uh, is through the application of machine learning. So here's what the concept of derivative data security comes in. Derivative data is data that is derived from a source. Derivative data security is coming up with security practices and mechanisms that have evolved to detect and protect derivative data from uh, primary data sources. So any, any data that is derived from a primary data source, we should have the ability to scour the entire enterprise, all laptops, PCs, servers, flash drives, wherever data could be stored and detect those derivatives of the original data source. This allows us to track that information and make sure that we are, uh, we are uh, uh, eliminating it from those locations. So derivative data is data that has been derived from primary data sources, particularly unstructured data. Now this is easy to do if data is structured, because you know, matching structured data from a source is easy, it's not that difficult. But what about unstructured data? For that matter, semi-structured data. What about images that was downloaded from a database for training purposes, machine learning training purposes, and now is, is floating around on laptops of uh, different individuals? What about a text document, a portion of a text document that was emailed to someone, and now it's, uh, and it was forwarded to 50 different people, but that we need to identify and isolate and delete from uh, those machines. So it's these kind of uh, unstructured data which, which present a particular problem. And that's where we could use machine learning techniques and deep learning techniques for identifying those derivatives and by finding similarities between the, the source data and the derivative data, and then hopefully going about and cleaning it throughout the enterprise. So I have two examples. I'll take a brief pause over here in case there are any questions uh, in the chat window. Otherwise I will go further. 
So there, there are two examples that I have, and I like to you know code things up just to for my understanding to understand for me to understand better. So I, I came up with two examples. The first one was uh, determining derivatives of text documents. So let's say I have a text document that is uh, represented by doc1.txt over here, and I have two other documents that are derived from the first document. So it may have a few paragraphs or a few sentences that were extracted from the first document. That's document two and document three. Now, since you know, this is a talk on AI, on AI slash ML slash DL, it, it seemed a bit natural to, um, to come up with text that was generated by some AI bot. So I went to uh, deepai.org. They have, uh, I believe, a GP2, GPT2 based neural net that is a uh, text generator. So, uh, you know, you just go to this link and you punch in a starting sentence or a phrase and that AI bot will generate a few paragraphs of text for you. So what I did was I went there and I, you know, gave it a starting phrase like artificial intelligence or something like that. And it, it gave me a few paragraphs of text. Let me show you the document. So I have all of this stuff and, um, in my GitHub repository, you can go and look at it. So these are my documents. This is the source documents. I typed AI or artificial intelligence in that uh, site and that neural net uh, uh, presented some, some data to me. Let's see, open the document. Yeah. So this is what it was uh, presented. So I was introduced to a machine viewer. This is a tool developed and managed by Bill Gates called QR, scan QR code. It's, it's a little random, but you know, it is somewhat good. It is somewhat um, sensible. There, there are some random thoughts definitely, but grammatically it's correct. And uh, logically it's not, but you know, you can't expect everything right now. And then this is GPT-2, it's not even GPT-3. Okay, so this is a document that was uh, presented by this bot and I use that as source material. Okay. So how do we go about determining derivatives of text document? There are some steps that could be followed. I'll go through the steps one by one, but at a high level, first of all, we need to determine the corpus of uh, text that we have. So those are the three documents, those are the paragraphs and the sentences within those three documents. And once we, we have that, what we'll do is we'll uh, tokenize all of the sentences. So, you know, come up with the individual words as uh, tokens and then create a dictionary of all the word frequency that exists in that, of all the words and the frequencies that as they exist in the corpus. And then in step four and step, step five is where we will find out the TFIDF values for all the sentences because we want to convert these sentences into text uh, uh, vector, uh, into vectors essentially. So that's where the text vectorization happens. And that's what we would do for comparison purposes. So I'll go through these steps one by one. Okay. So um, what does TFIDF stand for? TFIDF stands for term frequency inverse document frequency. So what happens is we could do two things. We could approach, we could create a vector through two different techniques. One is the simple bag of words where we find all of the words which are present, um, you know, and, and come up with the word frequency in that, for that corpus. And that is our bag of words. It's just a collection of words that exist and the frequency of those words. That is fine. However, that's not a very sophisticated technique. A better technique would be to use TFIDF. TFIDF stands for term frequency, inverse document frequency. So there are two parts to this. Um, we would use TFIDF over bag of words generally because there may be some words which are more common in one document and less common in another document. So those uh, words which are more common should possibly give, be given a, high, a higher weight. This, should not, this, is, this says height, it's not height, it's weights. So I'll fix that later on, but that is the weightage of those words should be uh, greater. So for example, we have three sentences over here, three documents over here, if we, if we will. Uh, I like to play football. Did you go outside to play tennis? And John and I play tennis. Uh, the first step was, as mentioned, tokenize the document. So convert all of those uh, sentences into, 
uh, individual tokens or find tokens from those sentences. So the first, second, and third sentence they break up in such a way. I like to play football, and this is the second sentence, and this is the third sentence. Once we've done the tokenization, which was the first step, we then calculate the term frequency for all of those words. So I don't show all of the words over here. The list is a little bigger, but uh, this is organized by uh, frequency. So uh, higher frequency words come up at the top. So the word play was appearing in three documents. So the the frequency is three, and tennis was coming up twice. Two was twice. So this is how we calculated the frequency. So uh, frequency of the of the of the word. And then once we have the frequency across all the documents, we calculate IDF. IDF is where we look at the total number of documents which were present. In this case, there were three documents, uh, each document containing a single sentence. So there were three documents. And we look at how many of those documents contained the word itself. So for example, there were three documents and the word play appeared in all three of those documents. So three divided by three is equal to one. The word tennis appeared in two of those documents. So the frequency was two and the number of documents are three. So three divided by two is 1.5. And the reason this is inverse document frequency is because you know it's an inverse ratio. The word two appeared in two documents. So three divided by two is 1.5. So this is what we'll do. We'll, we'll go through this exercise for all of the words that exist in the corpus. In order to get the TFIDF value, what we'll do is for each one of those words, we will apply the, we'll multiply the TF value with the corresponding IDF value that we've calculated separately. So for example, the word play appears once in sentence one and the IDF value that we calculated was uh, 0.2. So this comes to 0.2. Sorry, the, this, this is the, IDF value and this is the term frequency value. So it appears once in the number of words. There were five words in the first sentence and this was appearing once. So that's why it's 0 0.20. So this is a TF value and this is the IDF value. So this gives us a TF IDF value of 0.2. And we could do this for all of the words for this sentence. So tennis appeared zero times. So the term frequency was zero in, um, in uh, sentence one and the IDF value is 1.5. So that's why we get a zero. So once we do this exercise for sentence one, we can do it for sentence two and sentence three. And this gives us three vectors, each corresponding to each individual uh, sentence. So what we've done is successfully converted the document into uh, a set of vectors, which are now going to be part of our you know, subsequent analysis. So through this way, we've taken all of the text and we can do this exercise through you know, lots of uh, text documents out there come up with the corpus, come up with the TFIDF value, convert all of these into uh, sentence uh, vectors, and then store them for later analysis. Okay. Once that's done, we can find the similarity between two vectors, which are representing two, uh, two uh, sentences over here by applying something like similarity analysis. So similarity analysis can be done using, you know, cosine similarity. What this does is if we have two vectors, as we, uh, as we calculated in the previous steps, we came up with vector representation for each sentence. All we need to do is check how similar they are using, cos using like cosine similarity. What that does is you plot two of these vectors on a plane and try to calculate the, uh, the cosine value between them, the similarity value between them. And that value ranges from zero uh, so it ranges from one to minus one. So one would be when both vectors are similar or identical in some manner, but similar. And minus one would be if they are opposite. So the value ranges between them. So, if, so what would this mean? If you have two sentences and both sentences return the same vector, and if you try to find the similarity between both the vectors, that would mean that yes, the sentences are very similar to each other. So you found a match, a derivative of the original. If the value is slightly lower, like 0.86 or so, it's still close. There may be a few words which are, uh, which are modified, but still there is a high probability that yes, indeed, 
there is a similarity between those two uh, words or those two sentences. So let me uh, show this through a demo. I did some uh, coding yesterday to try to put together an example of, of what this works together. And I have a service that is running on my PC right now. It's the text vectorization service. What it does is it goes to a folder, it reads out all of the documents which are present there, the text documents, it pulls all of them out and goes through all of the steps that I mentioned, You know, determining a corpus, uh, finding the term frequency of all of the words, uh, calculating the IDF value, calculating the TF IDF value. And then finally storing, once it's done all of that, it then sends it to a, a MongoDB database that I'm running on a container, again, on my PC and uh, stores it over there. Once that's done, then I have another service that is running that uh, will periodically go and check the database for the entries. And it rotates through, it takes each value each um, each vector value and compares it to all of the other vectors, you know, the same approach that I showed in the previous slide using cosine similarity. And whenever it finds something that is above a certain threshold, uh, a modifiable threshold or a definable configurable threshold, it would highlight that as a possible match. So I'm going to really pause over here. Yes. So let me go through the code first. So this is the code. These are the three documents that I mentioned. The one that I showed at the beginning. This is document one. Document two is uh, just a small portion of document one, so just a single sentence. This sentence is the middle of the sentence. So I pulled out the middle sentence from document one and saved it in document two. And for document three, I just took the first sentence and modified it slightly. So document three is, is the first sentence of what we have over here, but with some portions removed. So it's not an identical copy. And this is a Python uh, file. What I'm doing over here, so I have some uh, import functions, I have some helper functions over here just for to do some, uh, for example, this is the differences. This is to calculate the CRC check for the file. Uh, this is to check if uh, it's what kind of file it is. It's is it a text file, is it um, image file or a video file? So this is where I get that information. And I do the vectorization over here. So this code does the vectorization. Lots of checks. Uh, I check to see if it's an ASCII file. If so, then this is where I build the, this is my first step where I build the corpus. And then I tokenize the corpus uh, based on individual sentences. This is my second step. And I use an NLTK framework, uh, a library that is available for the tokenization purposes. I try to eliminate some. So these are some regular expressions that uh, you know convert the corpus into lowercase words because I want this code to be case insensitive, not to be uh, so that the words, words with different cases are created the same. And I also get rid of some punctuation marks over here. So commas and other punctuations, I'll get rid of them. So this gives me the final corpus. And then I'll do the, what, uh, what the previous step said, come up with the term frequency. So this code does the term frequency, come, up, come, up, come with the, up with the IDF values over here, and then calculate the TF IDF values in this, in this uh, portion of the code. And uh, once I have that, I will write this into, I'll create a file record because I'm, I'm trying to write this in MongoDB. So what I'll do is I'll create a, I create a record over here and then I'll just write that, store that in MongoDB. So that's it. I have some code for vectorized image as well, but I'll skip that for now. And um, this is the main uh, function of the file. So when I start the program, it establishes the connection with the MongoDB database. It uh, would check for some options, so command line options, and uh, get the parameters for that are passed. So I, I can specify which folder I, this uh, code is going to go and scan. And based on that, once it has a list of files from that folder, it would call the 
the function that I showed above vectorized text which does the actual work. So let me run this. I'll clean everything out. And just to show that I'm not cheating, now there's no records over here. So everything is clean. Okay. Th this is my database connection. Sorry, I didn't mention that. So this is the this is the database that I'm running. And uh, right now I deleted everything. So there are no records present over here. Okay. Let's run this. So if I run this without specifying a folder, it would um, complain that this does not exist. So I need to specify the location where my files are going to be. So this is the same location where I have some sample data that is present. So the code is, um, because there's not a lot of data, so it ran fairly quickly. I have some debug information, some printfs, uh, prints present over here. So it's clear. This is the input folder, the files that it found were these in that folder these this is just the output of the corpus that was uh, th this is the output of the of the corpus that it found from the three files and the three text documents and uh, this is the tokenized sentences and finally these are the vector um, conversions that we got so this is for one sentence and this is for the second sentence and the reason I'm doing it on a sentence basis is just because of the partial derivative uh, nature. A document doesn't need to be completely copied for it to be detected. Only portions of a document will be copied. So I want to do this, uh, this analysis at a sentence level just so that I could look at partial derivatives as well. Anything below a sentence level may be uh, too much, but a sense sentence level granularity I think is good. So this is what I have. And these are all stored in the database. So now if I go and run the same command on my database, I will see all of these records present. So this is each, um, each entry, each document in now MongoDB. So unique ID. And then this is just some hard coded values. I was uh, trying to add some more information about files over here. And this is the vector that got stored that got calculated on the on the application the the client application and then got sent to the docker container where my mongodb is running and this is it stored over here now assuming i have an agent application that is running on my on, on just, not just my computer but multiple computers in the enterprise and constantly finding new files calculating these uh, vectors and sending it to the central database and, and storing it over there. So once I have that, there would be another service that is running that is going to connect to the database and try to find you know, vectors that are similar to each other. And for that, I wrote another application. I'll show you the code first. It's this application. And it does what, uh, it, it, all it does is calculate the cosine similarity between two vectors. So I read in all of the information from there. They have a, um, a couple of nested uh, loops. This first loop goes through all of the records. And then in the second loop, I go through, uh, I match the first record from one record from the, P, uh, from the main list with all of the records in, in that list as well, just to see, and then try to do a comparison, a cosine similarity between both of them. And when I found, I've set a threshold value of 0.5, it's hard coded right now, but it could be modified as well. And if it finds two records, then it would just print a message saying that you know, a match was found. So let me run this. Okay. So all of the records which were present in my database, I just quickly ran them and they did find a few matches. So it found some similarity between document four and, and document zero. Uh, it was a perfect match. So that's why you see a value of one. And then, but more interestingly, the ones that I, I modified slightly. So in, if you remember in doc2.txt and doc3.txt, I had some portions of uh, sentences that I had copied over. It found those matches as well. So this is, you know, uh, 
uh, entry five and entry one in the database, it says there's some similarity between them and it's above the 0.5 threshold that I put. So it's, it's somewhat high as well. And then similarly, there was another match that it found between record six and uh, record two. And that was significantly high. This is probably the, the sentence where I removed two or three words. That's why it's 0.79. It's fairly high, a fairly high match. So that was the first um, example of comparing de derivative and partial de uh, de derivative data sources from a source. I could go back to my slides. Let's see, do this example with image documents as well. So here I have some uh, images and these images are, this is my original image. This is for example, a picture of the Golden Gate Bridge that was taken and somehow this original image has been spread for example, in an organization and people have been making changes to it. So someone probably rotated the image, someone else tried to play with the color and uh, over here, someone makes some modifications by adding a filter, in this case, a, a sunrise or a sunburst filter. And this is a old you know, filter effect that makes the image seem a lot dated and aged. So this is my, on the upper left corner is my original image and everything else is a derivative of that image. You can see that the orientation has changed. You can see the color has changed. Even the size of the images are no longer the same. They have been changed. So there have been significant alterations from the original image. And let's see if we can find and we can determine if uh, all of these images derived sources are present in the original image or not. So how would we go about finding those derivatives if the image, if the document is an image as opposed to a text? For that, we'll be using something called SIFT. SIFT stands for Scale Invariant Feature Transform. It's a feature detection algorithm in computer vision. Uh, what SIFT does is it helps locate features in an image. Uh, these are called key points. So key points are, uh, are locations in the image, are points in the image, which could be used for image matching. The key point about key points, no pun intended, is that they are scale and rotation invariant. So it doesn't matter if the image uh, is uh, bigger or smaller, the, the derived image is bigger or smaller, or for that matter, if the image has been rotated through SIFT, we will still come up with the same key points in both the images. So this is my source image. The, there are a number of steps that we could go about trying to match two images despite their, uh, their differences in rotation, orientation, color, or so on. So let's say this is my source image. This is where I start from. So what I'll do is I'll first create a scale space to make sure that the features are scale independent. And then I'll identify key points in that image. So SIFT allows the identification of different key points. So when I ran this image through a SIFT, these are the key points that were identified. And I'll show the code for this in a, in a bit. For some reason, it found a few key points in the clouds, but generally it's fairly good. Like, you know, it found the key points around the bridges, the main features, uh, the grasses, the, the terrain, the sea, so the landscape behind. And the third and the fourth step is making sure that uh, the key points are rotation invariant. So even if I rotate the image, this is a rotated image and I ran the same code on the rotated image and it mostly found the same key points. There are some differences, like I didn't find anything over here and I didn't find the ones in the cloud, but the, the main ones, the ones around the bridge, it did find them. So that was fairly good. And the third is once that's done, then we come up with descriptors. So each key point has an associated descriptor. What is a descriptor? A descriptor looks at the pixels around the, the key point and uh, determines image gradients. And those image gradients are then you know, coded as, well, not coded, but as represented as descriptors because this allows each key point to have an explanation behind it. And that could be used for matching things. Otherwise, 
if we just have a single pixel being represented in a key point or something that is minute that has all of this missing information, there could be lots of false matches when you try to compare two images together. Okay. So for this, I will go to Google Colab and show some code. So the next um, demo that I'll be doing is I'll be doing it on uh, Google Colab. So if uh, someone is not familiar with Google Colab, it's it's a research tool that is provided by Google. It's for free. So if you go to colab.research.google.com, it's essentially a Jupyter notebook that is running in uh, their cloud environment. And uh, it's fairly easy to use. It's free to use as well. There's, there's some restrictions on how much you can do using the free solution, but that's fine for mostly academic purposes or learning purposes. I, I use it because it's very convenient and it's fairly nice to use. But this is not the only tool out there. There are other tools out there as well. Example, Azure Notebooks is also, so Microsoft have their own competitive uh, competitor to, to Google um, um, Colab. They, it's called, it was previously called Microsoft Notebooks, but now I think it's called Azure Notebooks. So this is a Jupyter Notebook that is running on uh, Google Colab and I will connect to it now. Okay. So I'm using some libraries over here. The first one is I'm using CV2. CV stands for computer vision and I'm using uh, NumPy as well. So NumPy is used because I'm doing some uh, array manipulation. So I'll, I'll use that as well. The other libraries I use because I'm fetch, uh, fetching things from, um, from my Google uh, my GitHub repository. So I'm just reading stuff directly from there as opposed to reading it from my computer. So let me run this. I need to do this first because the, the version of uh, OpenCV that is available on this on Google server, the is the recent version is not supported. So I need to download to a, uh, an older version. So let me first uninstall the most recent version, the 4. Uh, one version that is present over there and go to an older version, which is 3.4 because otherwise I'll run into some problems later down. Okay, so that was done. Now I need to restart it, uh, restart my runtime so that the, the older version of the library takes effect. So that was some housekeeping that needed to be done. Now I'll run my code. Okay. So these are my data sources. They are all present in the GitHub repository. So I'll pull them one by one and you can see the images as they come in. This is just a helper function that I have. Okay, so let me download the code one by one. So this is my original image. This is just a duplicate image that is identical to the first image. This is a rotated image that you see and we'll be doing comparison with the rotated image. This is uh, a similar image to the first one, but the colors have been changed and also the scale of the image has changed. You can see it's much bigger as well. And this is the image with a sunburst effect. And the final, this is a textured image as well. Okay. So if both images are identical, then how do we uh, find that? If they're identical, the colors are identical, the scale is identical. So all we do is just do a subtraction between image one and image two, and that would lead to a, a blank image or a black uh, image. And I'll, I'll show that right now. So we just do a simple checks. This is rule-based checking, nothing fancy, and do a difference between both images it would tell us the image is completely identical because all of the values, all of the RGB values are going to be zero. The color values are going to be zero in, uh, in all three colors, RGB. And if we want to confirm that, we can see that it's, it's an identical black image. So this is one quick and simple way of checking if two images are identical. But let's say if two images are similar but not identical, this is where we'll use the SIFT method. So the SIFT method is, so first we'll have to create the SIFT object. And once we've done that, we will now calculate the key points and the descriptors for those key points. So I'm gonna do this for all three images, or three images over here, not all of those images. 
solid for the original image, then the mixed color image that was bigger in scale and uh, had different colors, and also the uh, image that was rotated clockwise by 90 degrees. So we'll calculate key points and descriptors for all three of them over here. And once I've done that, I am now going to show the key points that it found. So let's do this for the original image. Let's run this and see if the original image. Um, I think it's, so that's what happens when we make last minute changes. I'm, I'm always afraid of these live demos because I'm always afraid that something will go wrong and uh, spectacularly wrong, not just wrong. Okay, so you can see that these are the image, uh, these are the key points which were calculated on the original image. And I can do that for the same thing. And that is the key points calculated in a rotated image. I can show you for the mixed colors one as well. So if I change this to mixed colors, you can see it found this for mixed colors as well. There's something wrong. I, I probably goofed up over here. That's the demo effect. Okay. Now what we'll do is we'll try to do a matching between the key points and the descriptors of both images. And for that, we'll use something called a, a FLAN-based uh, matcher. FLAN stands for fast library of approximate ne nearest neighbors. And there's, it uses a KNN match for that. So the K value of T of two and gets, gets the descriptors from, from the first image and the descriptors from the second image. So I'll run that over here. And once it's done this, once it's done this matching, I can now check to see how many of those um, key points actually matched between both the images. And that would give me a good idea of whether indeed there was something that was matching or not. So let me run this over here. And it found 190 key points that were matching based on this ratio that has been given. So the higher the ratio, the more number of matches will come. And if we decrease this value to something lower, you'll see the number of matches to be uh, decreasing as well. And if you run this, just to see the image, you can see that this is what it found. So these are the two images that we had. And uh, so this image uh, is the mixed color images. It has all of those key points that were calculated over there. And this is the original image. So despite the second image being much bigger in scale and different colors, but there is some considerable matching that is present across both those Im images. So what these lines are showing is there's like, there, there's, a, there's a key point over here that maps to a key point over here. So these are what the lines are signifying that these certain key points match other key points. If I change this threshold, if I decrease it to let's say 0.5, I'll get fewer results. I can keep go even further uh, lower. And if I run this again, I'll get less numbers which are uh, being matched between both the images. So this is how we can do image recognition. And just to conclude, if this were to be productized, then how would we go about doing it? So you could imagine, as I mentioned, a number of agent applications that are running on PCs, laptops, on Windows, Ubuntu, Linux, uh, Mac OS. All of these would be sending real-time data to some kind of uh, publisher uh, queue, some kind of messaging queue, maybe using something like Apache Kafka. And then we'll uh, process that in real time using something like Apache Spark, which does, you know, which has its own set of ML libraries. So those machine learning libraries could be processing anything in real time and storing it in the da database that could be used for our determination. So you can have some BI tool running over here that does some slicing and dicing, some kind of analysis. And that's it. Um, thank you, everyone. And if there are any questions, I'll be glad to answer them right now. Thanks, Ea. Uh, that was awesome. Uh, I might just stop the recording if i can work that out stop